But maybe we're being too literal. I mean, listening to some of this stuff, it really feels like Radio Rwanda. Kevin McCarthy spends half his day telling Republican members not to criticize progressive orthodoxy. In other words, we're just going to staple a green card to their diploma. You probably heard that phrase recently. So after years of watching and annotating Tucker Carlson's show on Fox News and his other public appearances, I finally have something to show for it. This video you are now watching is the most comprehensive and research case for why Tucker Carlson is a white nationalist on the entire internet. There are other videos that address this topic, but not in the years long and thorough way that this video will. If you don't understand why the clips I showed in the beginning prove that Tucker Carlson is a white nationalist more than anything else he's ever said, including what he said in this clip here. Now, I know that the left and all the little gatekeepers on Twitter become literally hysterical if you use the term replacement, if you suggest that the Democratic Party is trying to replace the current electorate, the voters now casting mm. ballots, with new people, more obedient voters from the third world. But they become hysterical because that's, that's what's happening, actually. Let's just say it, that's mm. true. Then, uh, just watch the rest of the video. Tucker says that nobody has ever offered a definition of white nationalists before. No, 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 we're hyperpolarized because and, uh, whenever you families. try to ask honest questions, as I'm trying to do right now, you are met with either accusations that you're a racist or a white nationalist, whatever that is. You're a bad person, in other words. So real quick, what am I talking about when I use the phrase white nationalist? A white nationalist is someone who understands whiteness as being a racial and national identity. There is, or should be, a community of white people globally that share political interests in relation to other ethnic and national groups. This community has a moral right and or political interest in creating a state that serves primarily, if not exclusively, those same white people. This national identity projects backwards onto dead people who may not have seen themselves as white while they were alive, as well as forwards on hypothetical white people who have not been born yet, but who still hold political, moral, and national value. The territory of the state should have a considerable majority of white people, if only for the security of the white state as a white state. The first thing Tucker has to do is to get his audience to think of themselves as white, as opposed to Christian or American or something else. He has to make their whiteness a subjectively felt and experienced identity. Probably the most common way he does this is by creating a feeling that his audience is being treated unfairly, and that others, usually immigrants or Democrats, are being treated with favor by elites. The people who have demonstrated contempt for our laws will arrive in court when asked. Gillibrand trust them to do that. And why wouldn't she trust them? That's the base, that's the whole immigration argument that she's making, which is that unlike you, regular Americans who are lazy and stupid and not worth helping, immigrants are basically perfect. They're smarter, more industrious, more creative than you or any of your American-born neighbors were or could be. People like Luciano Domingos Trejo, he was arrested in this country for sexually assaulting a minor. Thanks to Joe Biden, he gets to stay here. So does Juan Hernandez Rodriguez. Rodriguez is a self-described gang member with convictions for felony grand theft and burglary. He's been ordered removed from this country five separate times, but he's still here. Now he's staying. So is Atancio Areno Gutierrez, another convicted gang member, convicted of felony burglary. Also Luis Rodriguez Jacobo, convicted of manslaughter. Santos Maria won't be going anywhere either. He was also convicted of manslaughter along with armed robbery. When Joe Biden tells you the real threat to our country comes from within, these are definitely not the people he's talking about. Of course, he's talking about you. Another trope that Carlson uses to create white identity through white resentment is through the idea of a lack of immigrant gratefulness. Immigrants should be grateful to America for having been charitable enough to allow them to live here. And the best way to express that gratefulness is to not criticize America or anything American. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar is an avatar for this on his show. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, herself a symbol of America's failed immigration system, if there ever was one, someone who hates this country, coming here at public expense. Ilhan Omar is a person who clearly married her own brother in an immigration scam, who passionately hates the country that saved her, who reduces every conceivable issue to the most vicious kind of race baiting. Can a single human being actually be as loathsome as Ilhan Omar is? It's hard to believe. She's like a parody of repulsiveness. 
Sometimes you doubt she really exists. The RNC must have created her. Here's Congresswoman Ilhan Omar just today. And if anyone should love America, it's Ilhan Omar. This country rescued her from a squalid Kenyan refugee camp and made her a national figure, quite an ascent. But Ilhan Omar is not grateful. She hates us for it. Immigrants are a burden in the mind of Tucker's audience. So when one is allowed in and doesn't express gratefulness and submission, it is an affront to his mostly white audience. A sense of being wronged is a powerful tool in establishing shared identity. We have all suffered together, and they are privileged, preferred, and have benefited at our expense. One of the most common themes on Tucker Carlson tonight is the absurdity with which the word racist is sometimes used. But Carlson clearly goes beyond just mocking the word's overuse. He goes out of his way to reassure his audience that they and their beliefs and those of Tucker are not racist, and it is dumb to suggest otherwise. This constant reassurance is designed to give his audience resilience to the name-calling that they may be exposed to, and if they aren't, make them feel like they're being name-called anyway, and assure them that there is nothing wrong with them. This makes it easier for them to move past what Tucker is saying on the surface, and move into more explicit white nationalism, because they've built up such a high tolerance to being called a racist. Tucker takes the stigma resistance further by denying that white supremacy and nationalism are problems at all, or even coherent concepts. But the whole thing is a lie. If you were to assemble a list, a hierarchy of concerns or problems this country faces, where would white supremacy be on the list? Right up there with Russia, probably. It's actually not a real problem in America. The combined membership of every white supremacist organization in this country would be able to fit inside a college football stadium? I mean, seriously. This is a country where the average person is getting poorer, where the suicide rate is spiking. White supremacy, that's the problem. This is a hoax. We won't ignore what our intelligence agency have determined to be the most lethal terrorist threat to the homeland today. White supremacy is terrorism. We're not gonna ignore that either. My fellow Americans, look, we have to come together to heal the soul of this nation. <laughs> we have to come together to heal the soul of the nation by attacking our fellow Americans using a phrase no one will define. What does coming together mean? Well, it means because of a concept called white supremacy. Again, a phrase the left endlessly invokes but never defines, your civil liberties have now been suspended. By the way, the whole point of the Derek Chauvin trial was to inform you of that. This denial, paired with the stigma countering exercises, makes it sound reasonable when he refers to white nationalists who organized the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, as conservative activists, as he does in Chapter 4 of his book. Destigmatizing racism and the word racist makes these ideas more approachable. If you read that Richard Spencer is a mere conservative activist, and have been primed not to take the word racist seriously, then you can begin to consider his ideas more seriously. Destigmatizing racism and referring to white nationalists so flippantly is Tucker ensuring that the gateway to white nationalism stays wide open for viewers of his show. Demographic change. This is the tofu and potatoes of Tucker's white national signaling. It also comes and goes in waves and it isn't uncommon for him to not reference it for a week or longer. But it'll always come back, and he's been making this topic much more aggressively in the last month or so. Here's another clip barrage. Recently, we told you on this program about the wave of demographic change that has transformed the city of Hazleton, Pennsylvania. In the year 2000, Hazleton was less than 2% Hispanic. Today, thanks to mass immigration, Hazleton is majority Hispanic. More than half of the residents there speak a language other than English at home. How many poor people can we realistically accept before we're not that rich at all, but increasingly resemble the countries from which these people are fleeing? Instead, our leaders demand that you shut up and accept this. We have a moral obligation to admit the world's poor, they tell us, even if it makes our own country poorer and dirtier and more divided. As you may have guessed, he also talks about demographic change a lot in his book. Carlson writes in the introduction to his book, This is good news for the leadership of both political parties. Democrats know immigrants vote overwhelmingly for them, so mass immigration is the most effective possible electoral strategy. You don't have to convince or serve voters, you can just import them. 
He continues later on the page, What was the effect on the country? Thanks to mass immigration, America has experienced greater demographic change in the last few decades than any other country in history has undergone during peacetime. Our elites relentlessly celebrate those changes, but the very scale destabilizes our society. If you grew up in America, suddenly nothing looks the same. Your neighbors are different. So is the landscape and the customs, and very often the languages you hear on the street. You may not recognize your hometown. Human beings aren't wired for that. They can't adjust change at this pace. It disorients them. Over time, it makes even the most open-minded people jumpy and hostile and suspicious of one another. It encourages tribalism. He returns to this theme again in Chapter 2. Speaking on changes in American immigration law, Carlson writes, In the 2016 Democratic platform, the party refrained immigration from a debate about economics to the next frontier in the struggle for civil rights and social justice. Any references to the effect of immigration on American citizens were deleted. According to the Democratic Party, the goal of immigration policy was to ensure the well-being of immigrants. The current quota system, the platform explained, discriminates against certain immigrants, including immigrants of color. It's hard to think of a claim more at odds with numerical reality. In 2016, only about 18% of immigrants to the United States were white. Thanks almost entirely to immigration, the population of the country had gone from 84% white in 1965, when Congress stopped favoring European immigrants, to 62% white in 2015, and the number was dropping every year. There are a lot of things you could call American immigration law, but the product of white racism isn't one of them. Carlson not so subtly sneaks in the point that whites are declining in proportion due to non-white immigration, and presents this to demonstrate that our immigration system isn't racist. But it is understood that he wants the system to change enormously, while also making the day whites or 49% seem imminent and threatening. He also sidesteps historical European immigration in his book, and again at Politicon 2018. When the Irish were first coming in, they were dirt poor. They were uh, escaping a famine. The Italians dirt poor. The Jews dirt poor. Under your logic, would we not have kept them out? Well, no, because this is a sit. Hold on, this is a sit. This is a situational. Before you applaud too vigorously, I can win you. Listen, <laughs> it's a situa- It's a situational decision. So when we had the largest wave up until recently of immigration into this country at the beginning of the last century, that was the industrialization period in this country. So who manned the factories? Who made the shoes? Who wove the textiles? Immigrants did. There was a massive need for labor, and we responded by importing huge amounts of labor. We did until 1924, in which case Americans, including recent naturalized immigrants, looked around and was like, you know what? We've had a lot of change. Change creates volatility in your society. We had a lot of drama, the progressive movement, the wobblies. We had a lot going on in this country. We were like, you know what? We're shutting it down. And we shut it down from 1924 to 1965, not because we're racist, but because we made the decision. Now what we're looking at, and this is what drives me maybe craziest, is a landscape totally transformed by technology, by automation. This point on labor shortages really just allows him to say that mostly European immigration in the 18 and 1900s was good but mostly non-white, more modern immigration is bad. He makes his same point, but in a different way, and more importantly to a different audience in his book. From the 1800s through the 1950s, maids, nannies, gardeners, and other domestic help were ubiquitous in the upper middle class households. Economic prosperity gradually eliminated the huge pool of unskilled labor that filled these jobs, but modern immigration policy has revived America's servant class. Immigrants now fill countless jobs as nannies, gardeners, cooks, and housekeepers. For employers, the best part of the new arrangement is that there's no guilt attached. Let's say you lived in an affluent household in Boston in 1910. You've got help at home. Everyone in your neighborhood does. The problem is your servants are Irish. They may do a fine job making breakfast and ironing the sheets, but you can never quite relax. These are people who speak your language and look like you. At some point, you may wonder, why is someone who could be my cousin cleaning my toilet? It's uncomfortable. Third world immigration solves this problem. When your housekeeper is a peasant from Honduras, there's no reason to feel bad about it. You don't have to wonder about the details of her life outside work. You can barely communicate with her. She may be cleaning your floors for a minimum wage or less, while your children travel abroad. But you're not exploiting her, just the opposite. You're giving her a hand up, allowing her to participate in the American dream. 
Here, Tucker is communicating that these European immigrants of the past are essentially the same as you, his likely white reader, or the white wealthy person he is imagining. Never mind that many immigrants from Europe actually couldn't speak English, and they often spoke Italian, German, or Irish if you want to go back a bit further. Also, intra-European racism among immigrants to America was actually very real. Italians and Irish did not always see themselves as being in the same ethnic or political category. Remember, white national identity projects backwards onto people who did not see themselves as being in the same political or racial category. Carlson does this very shrewdly. These white immigrants were one of us, and modern, mostly non-white immigrants are not. But how does Tucker justify this demographic paranoia in his own words? Well, the primary way in which he does this is to appeal to the racial and national demographics of American partisanship. In other words, which ethnic groups tend to vote for which party? This is a blanket amnesty for virtually every illegal alien who has already taken an American job. And once this amnesty is granted, it will never be taken away. Bet on that no matter what they tell you. Anyone who lives in Washington can confirm that. Once passed, it's not going away. And at that point, there will be no more debate about illegal immigration. The issue will be settled permanently, and Democrats will win every presidential election for the rest of your life, the rest of your children's lives, the rest of your grandchildren's lives. That's the point of this. In their first year, Democrats will give voting rights to every illegal alien in this country and then encourage many others to join them from abroad. At a minimum, that means more than 20 million new Democratic voters overnight. No Republican will win nationally again. We will have one-party rule. Tucker emphasizes the inevitability and the perpetuity of Democrat dominance if more immigrants are allowed to come and vote. The Democrats will win forever if there is amnesty. This suggests that minority supporting Democrats is not contingent. It is necessary. Non-whites are fundamentally different, which means increased Democrat support is guaranteed and permanent. If you want Republicans to ever win, immigrants cannot be allowed in. He is talking about protecting the future of a category that is fundamentally unchanging across time. I think this more nearly describes an ethno-national category than a political party, which can more easily change in composition. This point on partisan politics in the United States is also how Tucker smuggles in the idea of white replacement theory. This is the theory similar to white genocide, which we'll talk about a bit later, that says that whites are being deliberately replaced by non-whites. Apart from being mathematically misleading, the theory is white nationalist because it suggests that whites need to prevent their declining percentage of the population as a way to secure political dominance in the territory they occupy. Who are legitimate I'm not demonizing anybody. I'm, I'm not against the immigrants. I'm just mm -hmm. for Americans, and nobody cares about them. It's no. like, shut up, you're dying, we're going to replace you. Like most advanced countries, Hungary struggles with a declining birth rate. In America, for perspective, the average woman has 1.7 children. That's the lowest figure we've ever had in our history. In Hungary, the number is even lower than that, fewer than 1.5 children per family. Hungary has lost more than half a million people in the past 30 years. At this rate, unless something changes dramatically, there will be no more Hungarians. The neoliberals who run the European Union and every think tank in Washington strongly agree on what Hungary should do to fix the problem. Give up. Instead of helping the native population to have more children, the Hungarian government, they say, should import a replacement population from the third world. That's the George Soros solution. The other way he justifies talking about demographics as much as he does is with an appeal to stability. Um, this comes out a lot when he talks about why he thinks countries remain countries uh, as opposed to falling apart. Um, this is one of his stranger themes, uh, but he brings it up a lot. I want to show three separate clips that were filmed close to each other. The first is from the Independent Institute on October 16th, 2018. The second from Politicon, October 21st, 2018. And the third is from Ben Shapiro's podcast on November 2nd, 2018. The proximity of these three events and the way Tucker repeats himself suggests some level of sincerity in what he is saying. That America is an idea, but in order for it to work, 
everyone has to buy into the idea. It's just a reminder that if you want to have a country that's cohesive, that doesn't fall apart and wind up at war with itself, you need to find a unifying belief that everyone buys into and new arrivals are required to buy into. And I think the Bill of Rights is a good place to start. I'm just saying the very most obvious thing, which you must have something in common with everyone else in your country, or why would you be a country? And if you don't think that, you haven't thought about it very much. That's all I'm saying. Work. I mean, countries don't hang together by accident, particularly large, diverse ones that don't have a majority in any category. So there's no, if you don't even have a shared language or history or culture, you know, why would you co you know, why would you remain united as a country? And the answer, which I actually believe in, is that you could hang together around a common idea, a common set of beliefs. You know, here's what we're all for. You know, there are certain things that you think are just basic to being American. What are those common ideas? I mean, I guess I'd start with the Bill of Rights. I mean, that's not hard. Do you know what I mean? Since it is a founding document, it's the foundational document. These clips actually offer some of the strongest evidence that he is not a white nationalist. He offers some alternatives to national identity besides race. He emphasizes the English language, political values, especially the Bill of Rights. But we can also see that he doubts these forms of identity are sustainable in the long term. That America is an idea, but in order for it to work, everyone has to buy into the idea. And as I age, I understand the weakness inherent in that system. It can work, but you have to be really thoughtful about it. That you could hang together around a common idea, a common set of beliefs. You know, here's what we're all for. But our ruling class, and I do think this is the least responsible, the most reckless thing they have done, is they have not only failed to come up with what that set of common beliefs is, they have argued against the fact that it should exist. So in introducing these alternatives, he is also undermining them. Values and language-based unity are vulnerable, he says. But we still need a majority in something. It should be noted, though, that when he does explore the idea of why populations don't fall into civil war, the forms of unity he emphasizes aren't racial. This is one of the more puzzling themes of Tucker Carlson, this why countries stay together thing. And if I ever interviewed him, this is probably what I would want to get to the bottom of first. Besides that, there are some other reasons to fairly doubt that Tucker is actually a white nationalist. So look at the numbers. They never look at the next set of numbers, which is, OK, just, just take out white voters and just ask Latino voters or African-American voters, do you think we need a ton more immigration? And we need, like, maybe we have about 1.1 million a year people coming in legally now. Let's double it to two. How would you feel about that? They're not for that at all. What are they for? They're for what everybody is for, which is the ability to raise your own kids. If you want to win new voters to your party, stop with the identity politics crap and go with the universal appeals that, again, by their nature, appeal to everyone. And chief among them is the freedom to raise your own kids. Hispanic voters are not for open borders, actually, at all. And it's patronizing. Indeed, it's probably a species of racism to assume that they are. You know what they're really for? Way more than white voters, even? Getting to raise your own kids. Do they get to do that? No, they can't, because they can't afford it. Same with African-American voters. So it never occurs to the geniuses on the Hill, if you're making a play for non-traditional Republican votes, maybe you should take a non-traditional Republican position on something, and why wouldn't it be a pro-family position in favor of raising your own children? Well, focus group experts say it's because of shifting demographics, and the GOP must win over more minority voters in order to survive, particularly Hispanic voters, and that's probably true. So it turns out that opening the borders is not the key to winning the Hispanic vote. So what is the key? Well, maybe allowing parents to raise their own children. How about that? Turns out Hispanic voters are for that passionately. One Pew survey showed that 73% of Hispanic Americans believe it is better to have one parent stay at home to raise children rather than having both parents work. But if this is all I had, I would still probably say that the evidence that Tucker is specifically a white nationalist, as opposed to a non-ideological bigot or something, is inconclusive, if not dubious.
But certain white nationalists and supremacists love Tucker Carlson. The editor of the Daily Stormer, Andrew Anglin, praises him frequently. Nick Fuentes, who at this point is one of America's most influential white nationalists, and a scheduled speaker at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, also believes Tucker is an important ally. This is a segment from his nightly show, America First, just so you can get a taste of his content. Max says, if I take one hour to cook a batch of cookies and Cookie Monster has 15 ovens, working 24 hours a day, every day for five years, how long does it take Cookie Monster to make six million batches of cookies? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> Certainly, uh... <laughs> oh, no, no. It doesn't really sound correct to me. Wait a second. It takes one hour to cook a batch of cookies, and you have 15 ovens, pr probably in four different kitchens, right? Doing 24 hours a day, every day for five years. How long would it take you to make six million? Hmm, I don't know. It certainly wouldn't be five years, right? Uh, the math doesn't seem to add up there. The math doesn't quite seem to add up there. I don't think you'd result uh, in six million, maybe 200 to 300,000 cookies. And I think the Red Cookie Association said something like that, probably 200 to 300,000 cookies baked, probably. And in addition, you know, in this hypothetical, I imagine that if you took aerial photographs over the kitchens, you would need to see certain smokestacks to release the smoke from baking the cookies and the smokestacks would project certain shadows, but I guess they're not visible in the aerial photographs taken over the kitchens. Moreover, if you look at the soil texture, it's really not deep enough for mass cookie storage underground. Um, and so there's a lot of things, you know, in the cookie kitchen, they say that the ovens are uh, wooden and they have windows on them and they're not totally secure. And the ovens that they use they, they actually did sort of an ad hoc use of that particular kind of oven, even though they made a perfectly good design for ovens for a different purpose, for delousing. I mean, you know, for something else. So none of it really adds up. I don't know. It just kind of doesn't really make sense, this, this crazy cookie analogy. Uh, you have to really, you have to be, that's sort of an esoteric uh, story. That's from Cookie Right. You wouldn't understand that if you're just sort of passing through, if you're just a normie. So six million cookies, eh, eh, I don't buy it. That's all irony. I'm an irony bro. That's all irony. Uh, you know, I love and respect everyone. Everything that the government says is true. Here is a recent segment of Fuentes on the highly respected podcast of another white nationalist named Scott Greer, a Daily Caller and Radix Journal alum. But moving on to the final person, I want to get your thoughts on Tucker, because there's been a lot of differences uh, between you. You know, you've had your problems with Tucker. So I want to get like right now. What What are your thoughts on um, Tucker Carlson? I'm 100% pro Tucker now, and uh, okay. yeah, I'm not. I'm not uh, I won't shy away from the fact that I was very Tucker during the election, and uh, and I I still I still well. In fairness, I talked to some people, and and people have told me why he might have done what he did back then. During Stop the Steal, I, I felt like we were going out there and we were campaigning everywhere to, to have the state legislatures overturn the voter fraud in the presidential election. I mean, I, I went to Lansing, Atlanta, D.C., Phoenix, Harrisburg. I was spending tens of thousands of dollars of my own money, and it was crazy. You know, I mean, crazy, hectic schedule. And just doing everything that I could. And I'm just some guy. You know, I don't have any connections for, for the most part in like these state governments or anything. I was just doing whatever I could to get the state legislatures to do whatever they could to keep Trump in office. Because I recognized the urgent threat, uh, the imminent threat that was posed by the Biden administration. And I knew the gravity of it even back then. I knew that it was going to be catastrophic if he got in. And it, you know, it turned out to be true. And I saw Tucker and, and night after night, he would not talk about the election fraud. And when he did, he talked about how Sidney Powell wouldn't come on his show. And look, I agree. Sidney Powell turned out to be a little bit of a kook. And she was focusing on the wrong parts of the election fraud. They were focused on chasing this Dominion thing when in reality it was the mail-in ballots. So it's not even like I'm, I'm white knighting for Sidney Powell. It's like night after night, you do your show for millions and millions of people. This is going on. And it was hardly talked about. Instead, he would talk about, oh, the polls were wrong or, you know, whatever. So it was just like shocking why he didn't go out to bat for Trump 
in, in as much as he could have back then. And it was like, it felt like a personal betrayal because it's like, if I could go out and do it and I'm putting my ass on the line and I'm wearing a bulletproof vest and hiring security and spending all my money doing this kind of stuff. It's like, why, why can't Tucker just throw a little support our way? So, so I was anti-Tucker for a little while because of that. And even recently, you know, he made that comment where he said, um, you know, replacement migration basically is happening, but it's a voting rights issue. And I said, and he goes, it's, it's not, it's not about white. It's not about race. And I said, well, how, how productive is it really to explicitly deny that it's racial? How productive is it to, to go there? Cause I think it is a good thing to go there and expose people to that, but then turn around and say, oh yeah, well, it's, it's definitely not a race thing. It's merely about this. And it was the question. It wasn't like, hey, this isn't good enough. You need to go all the way, name them. It's not like that. No, I, I just said open-ended. I said, how is this really helping us to go halfway and then disavow the rest? To say replacement is happening, but if you think it's racial, you're a white supremacist. It's not racial. You know what I mean? So I question how, how you know, there's an argument to be made that it's effective. I think there's an argument to be made that it's not. But then... Then he comes back on the show on Monday, a couple of weeks ago, and he blows open the whole thing on, on replacement migration and says, nationalism for me and not for thee. And the ADL said that. And then he, I mean, he really went all the way, dropped the full, whole red pill about what's happening, talked about replacing the demographics. He got California in there, Israel, ADL. I mean, it was all there. And it was the truth. I mean, that that's why it was so effective is because he just dropped a truth bomb on like four or five million people on Monday, a couple of weeks ago. And so that to me was totally redeeming in my eyes. That was a huge, I thought that was a huge risk. That was like the most truthful thing I've ever heard on cable news, on Fox News. And I've been watching Fox News since I was in high school. I've been watching Fox News for like 10 years, you know? And so that's the most red-pilled, truthful thing I ever heard. That If he was like, if he was not who he said he was, he would have never said something like that, you know? So to me, that was totally redeeming in my eyes. And look, I mean, I've always been pro-Tucker. I did not like the election coverage. I, I was dubious about what he initially said about replacement migration. But to me, that was so epic. It completely redeemed him. And then he went and mentioned my no-fly situation. So, so you know, I'm very pro-Tucker now. Okay, well, I think that's I would I would probably largely agree with everything with that. The clip that Fuentes is talking about is from April 12th of this year, in which Tucker refers back to another episode earlier that month. The counties in California with the highest percentage of Republicans are not coincidentally those with the lowest percentage of immigrants and vice versa. California changed because the population changed. In fact, it's the central idea of the modern Democratic Party. Demographic replacement is their obsession because it's their path to power. Go to the Anti-Defamation League's website sometime if you'd like a glimpse of what an unvarnished conversation about a country's national interest might look like. In a short essay posted to the site, the ADL explains why the state of Israel should not allow more Arabs to become citizens with voting rights. Quote, with historically high birth rates among the Palestinians and a possible influx of Palestinian refugees and their descendants now living around the world, the ADL explains, Jews would quickly become a minority within a binational state, thus likely ending any semblance of equal representation and protections. In this situation, the Jewish population would be increasingly politically and potentially physically vulnerable. It is unrealistic and unacceptable, the ADL continues, to expect the state of Israel to voluntarily subvert its own sovereign existence and nationalist identity and become a vulnerable minority within what was once its own territory, end quote. So if I think there isn't enough here, but white nationalists like him, then maybe they see something in Tucker that isn't clearly visible, at least in what we have seen so far. In order to be a real dog whistle, most people should not be able to hear it. It is Tucker communicating his support of white nationalism to white nationalists instead of communicating softer messages to non-white nationalists. In order for Tucker to get away with this, these have to be extremely subtle. I thought about including Tucker's coverage of South Africa and how he misled his audience into believing that whites there were having their land stolen by blacks. But this story was covered widely, and so it's not really a dog whistle. I also could have talked about the murder of Molly Tibbetts, a white woman, by an illegal immigrant. 
These stories were also covered on the same days, on August 22nd and 23rd of 2018, and I think they were meant to complement each other. Tibbetts is where we are now, but if we aren't careful, we will become South Africa. Neither of these really work as a dog whistle, because one, the entire national media picked up both, and Tucker is still leading his mass audience to a conclusion, rather than stating the conclusion in a coded way. But you can consider the Molly Tibbetts and South Africa episodes from August of 2018 as honorable mentions. Another quick honorable mention would be when Tucker basically read out the white nationalist 14 words, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children, when complaining about Congresswoman Omar and Senator Duckworth. The problem is there are many of us here who do like this country. We live here. We don't want to destroy it. We have every right to fight to preserve our nation and our heritage and our culture. And when vandals like Tammy Duckworth and Ilhan Omar tell us that we're not allowed to question their patriotism, even as they scream about how horrible America is, we have every right to laugh in their faces. And we should. But even that isn't as obvious as these next examples. What's actually happening, says Tom Steyer, is that Kavanaugh was installed by a specific racial group in order to hurt and disempower every other racial group in America. This is tribal warfare posing as democracy, and your tribe is losing. That's what Tom Steyer is telling you. Now, as a factual matter, this is insane. It's the kind of lunacy that would have gotten you booted off a cable channel five years ago. It's also a lie, and it's dangerous. It's exactly the kind of thing that Hutu leaders in Rwanda were saying in the early 1990s. Watch it. Look, obviously it's him. easy to say, you were wrong, you should admit it, apologize. But maybe we're being too literal. I mean, listening to some of this stuff, it really feels like Radio Rwanda. It feels like the media trying to <laughs> gin up. I'm serious. Like, why are they doing, why are they doing this? Why is it so important to prove that America is a bad place and that NASCAR fans are racist? Tucker mentions Radio Rwanda, a Hutu supremacist radio station that helped incite genocidal violence against the Tutsis in the 1990s. The other remark that this is just like the Hutus in the early 1990s refers to the same historical period and to the same genocide. There is no other way to interpret what Tucker is saying here other than the white genocide is either a serious risk in the future, imminent, or already happening. In the context of the videos, he can only be analogizing Tutsis to white people and Hutus to non-whites. White genocide is the white nationalist and supremacist theory that there is a plot to annihilate white people politically, if not numerically, to replace them or exterminate them. This theory is white nationalist because it focuses his audience on their white identity, encourages them to see white nationhood as providing security against this white genocide. I really cannot think of another reason why a black NASCAR driver mistaking a garage pole for a noose would cause someone to mention Radio Rwanda, unless you believe in white genocide. There is a third possible example of this from October 1st, 2018, where he comes close to saying white genocide explicitly. But he did not notably advocate for genocide. A Georgetown professor called Christine Fair did do that. She recently tweeted this, quote, Look at this chorus of entitled white men justifying a serial rapist's arrogated entitlement. All of them deserve miserable deaths while feminists laugh as they take their last gasps. Bonus, we castrate their corpses and feed them to swine. Yes. Georgetown has issued a statement defending FAIR. Of course they have. Marjorie Clifton is the founder of Clifton Consulting LLC and she joins us tonight. What do you think of that, Marjorie? Do you think it's... You think it's within bounds of reasonable political discourse for a Georgetown University professor to call for genocide? That clip comes just seven days before the this is just like the Hutus in the 1990s remark and is also in the context of the Kavanaugh hearings. That makes me think that the subject of white genocide was probably just on his mind in early October 2018 and he wanted to smuggle it in wherever he could. The reason why I hesitate to include this last example it's because the tweet he is attacking actually is pretty stupid. I don't think his response to it was that unreasonable. It's only suspect, really, in light of all the other things he said. Uh, but what makes the other two examples stronger is that the white genocide reference is clumsy and clearly forced in. 
but I included this clip anyway, and so you can just make up your own mind about it. The second dog whistle is much softer. It's almost impossible to hear. Kevin McCarthy spends half his day telling Republican members not to criticize progressive orthodoxy. When Tucker is talking about House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy penalizing members of the Republican Party for questioning progressive orthodoxy, who is he talking about? It turns out he's referencing a specific person, or at least he has a specific person in mind. That episode is from March 11th, 2019. About two months earlier, former Iowa Congressman Steve King was stripped of his committee assignments by McCarthy for saying that he was confused why someone would be offended by white supremacy and white nationalism. He would go on to disavow both. Uh, but this point is interesting because Tucker does not name King. He leaves it to an informed audience to know who, who he is talking about and an uninformed audience to look it up. Liberals and McCarthy are trying to get good people canceled, says Tucker. Good people like Steve King, who is a white nationalist. Okay, so this is the last example of a dog whistle I have, and it's the most important one for me. Um, I remember when I watched this episode live, and I thought, like, shit, he really is a white nationalist. In order to understand the significance of what I think is the most important side comment Carlson has ever made on the show, we have to go back to November and October of 2019. Friend of the channel, Charlie Kirk, had launched what he dubbed the culture war on American college campuses. He would go to different schools, give some lectures, and take a Q&A, often with a special guest such as Donald Trump Jr. The way these things are supposed to go is that a left-wing college student with no media training and an incomplete political education asks Kirk a question. And then Kirk dunks on them by controlling the mic and provoking applause from his audience. But something unusual started happening around the middle of October. Instead of being challenged by leftists, Kirk started getting questions like this. Question. So from America First perspective, why do we give $3.8 billion to Israel, which is more aid than we've given to Africa, more aid than we've given to South America, and more aid than we've given to the Caribbean combined, which is home to a billion poor people, especially when they deliberately attacked the USS Liberty in the 1970s? That is incorrect. Do not peddle they, conspiracy theories in our event. That is not acceptable. Do not say that. Um, my question is for Charlie Kirk. Um, why do you deny the attack on the USS Liberty? which is well documented by both U.S. and Israeli sources, and which resulted in the death and injuries of over 200 Americans. I deny that it was a deliberate attack by the Israeli government. That's what I deny. Thank you for being here tonight. <coughs> is there another comment you'd like to make about that? Sure. Uh, some people would disagree. Uh, I would just like to ask one more quick thing. Would you be willing to debate somebody that is an actual America First conservative like Nick Fuentes? No. Thank you. So I just have to take issue with the stance most right-wing pundits like yourself have, which I find hypocritical. Recently at a talk in Jerusalem, you made the claim that America isn't a people, it's just an idea. You also claimed that Israel isn't just an idea, it's a people. This had me thinking. You cherish Zionism and people like Bibi Netanyahu or Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, people who are open ethnic nationalists who care very deeply about maintaining a Jewish ethnic majority in Israel. How can you be that vocal? I mean, how can you be a vocal critic against any and all forms of European ethnic nationals, nationalism while holding them opinions? Thank you for being here tonight. I expanded on those comments later in the video and beyond that, saying that America also has a beautiful history and is a place, and you know, I expanded on that in a variety of ways. Um, not the first time I've gotten this question this week. It seems like it just keeps on coming back, and even tonight, look. According to the U.S. Census Bureau population projections, in 2045, whites will account for less than 50% of the population in the United States. Given that the Democratic Party's policies do not point towards the maintaining of our American ideals, and given the most groups other than whites overwhelmingly vote Democrat, how can we be sure that said American ideals will be maintained when millions of immigrants come in with majority Democratic support? Can you prove that our white European ideals can be maintained if the country's majority is no longer made up of white European descendants? If, if, if right. not, should we support I, I, I mass applauding. legal let, immigration? Let okay, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. All right, let me... Let me, let me 
let me answer, I guess, your question with my perspective. I've been asked this a couple times in the last week and a half, that, oh, how are we going to keep the white status of this? I find that to be a racist question. I reject the idea behind it. I do not think America should become a white ethno state as a country. In fact, I think that is a fringe perspective. I appreciate you being here, and I'm going to rationally push back against it every single time I come in contact with it. As Thank you, you for coming tonight. I appreciate it. So my name is Patrick Casey. I'm an American nationalist and America First patriot. And yeah. Thanks, guys. So, and despite all of that, despite my ardent support for the president and his policies, I was actually kicked out of CPAC earlier this year. But I didn't kick you out of this event. No, 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 and I'm not going okay. to blame you. Just I'm making not sure. Blame, yeah, yeah, you're very defensive here, I get that. Um, as was my good friend Nicholas J. Fuentes, whom I believe we, you were just discussing up there. But look, I'm not going to blame Wait, you for that. I, I just want to make sure. I've got a question here. Is that the um, troll that keeps tweeting about he's me? He's not a Twitter? troll, he's a very intelligent guy who has a lot to say. Yeah. He's wait, wait. somewhat of a troll, but well, he seems to be getting a lot of you guys to say stuff for him tonight, so... This Q&A battle would go on at least until November 12th. This span of a few weeks would be known as the Groiper War by those who participated in it. It was cheered on and partially organized by the previously mentioned white nationalist Nick Fuentes. The idea was to get white nationalists to dress in MAGA hats and ask questions to Kirk that would try to get the conservatives at these events to think more about demographic change and to question their support for Israel. These sorts of questions would visibly agitate Kirk. But why does this matter? Well, during the Groiper War, Charlie Kirk had a line that was unpopular with the Groipers, or the people who affiliated with Nick Fuentes. He said at least twice that immigrants who graduate from American universities should have a green card stapled to the back of their diploma, meaning that foreign graduates would have legal residency in the United States. That if you graduate from a United States university with a skill, upon graduation of your diploma, we should staple a green card behind your diploma. The Gruber War was a fight over influence in the Republican Party between mainstream conservatives like Kirk and white nationalists. On November 11th, 2019, while the war was still happening, Tucker showed not only that he was aware of the Gruber War, he also took a side. The program allows foreign students who studied American universities to stay in the country after they graduate. In other words, we're just going to staple a green card to their diploma. You've probably heard that phrase recently. And since employers who use F-1B visas are not required to pay payroll taxes, they get, in effect, a tax subsidy for hiring foreigners over U.S. citizens. How's that for America last? So he talks about the green card diploma thing and says you might have heard of that recently. Where might a viewer of Tucker Carlson Tonight have heard that recently? Only one place. At recent Turning Point USA Culture War events, where the Gorper War was taking place. Tucker also says, how's that for America last? With a quick head nod, as if to signal something. America last is a reference to Nick Fuentes' nightly show called America First, in which he promoted the Gorper War, and gave people advice on what kinds of questions to ask. What Carlson said was also understood at the time by white nationalists as being a direct signal of support, and they were ecstatic about it. They immediately understood the importance of what Tucker had said. And so did I. And now, so do you.